So our first speaker this afternoon is Sandra Thompson, who is the director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency, who is going to be speaking with the NEIC Secretary Treasurer, Elizabeth Kelleher Dwyer, director of the Rhode Island Department of Business Regulation. Thanks, Eric. So I realize we have a challenge because we're the first speakers after lunch, but I think Director Thompson's up for it. I hope so. So uh, the shortage of affordable housing is contributing to an ongoing global crisis. The World Bank says that 1.6 billion people, about 20% of the global population, are expected to be affected by global housing shortage. Data from the IMS shows the cost of housing has grown faster than incomes in most countries. Likewise, the OECD indicates that even before COVID-19, house prices have been increasing dramatically in OECD member countries, especially for renters. And the supply of affordable housing has failed to meet demand. This is a global problem. Not surprisingly, housing and real estate are intertwined with the insurance industry as the availability of insurance affects customers' abilities to build, buy, or even rent a home. The Federal Housing and Finance Agency, which is referred to here in the U.S. as FHFA, plays a critical role in protecting Americans through the home buying process. The FHFA provides oversight of the Federal National Mortgage Association, we call that Fannie Mac, the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, Freddie Mac, and the Federal Home Loan Banking System, which includes 11 federal home loan banks and the Office of Finance. And FHFA ensures that these entities fulfill their mission in operating in a safe and sound manner to serve as a reliable source of liquidity and funding for housing finance and community investment. In recent years, engagement between FHFA and the NEIC has increased as property insurance is becoming a bigger part of the housing affordability conversation. We know these issues are not unique to the U.S. We're, here, we're pleased to welcome FHFA Director Sandra Thompson here for today's conversations. Uh, she is going to address the efforts the U.S. is taking to respond to Americans' housing needs and how the FHFA is contemplating the role of insurance in that effort. And just personally, I'd like to say I'm honored to serve with Director Thomas on the uh, FSA, Financial Stability Oversight Council, and we've gotten to know each other a little bit there, and I know that she's very uh, involved in these issues. So let me start with the first question. As part of the process of buying a home, homeowner's insurance was perhaps viewed as a somewhat extraneous cost. With the recent rise in rates and with fewer companies writing in some areas, do you think that's still how home buyers see it? Or is there greater awareness of insurance as a critical piece of the process? That's a great question. First, Elizabeth, let me thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I'd like to thank other state insurance commissioners because we've worked really closely on these uh, issues. I mean, to specifically speak to your question, um, I do think that there is an increasing awareness by consumers of insurance. So we at FHFA, as you mentioned, are the regulators for Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the 11 federal home loan banks. And we are responsible for approximately $8 trillion of outstanding mortgage-backed securities, predominantly in the single-family business line, but also multifamily apartments. And so for us, our single asset is mortgage-based, or it's collateral-based. So these insurance issues are just critical for us. We've seen the number of natural disasters increase in the past few years, and we've seen uh, things that we just had not seen before, like snowing in California earlier this year. And you see that, you know, places that are outside of what we call our normal flood zones are being impacted. So if you have insurance inside the flood zone, you're covered and it's required, but outside we're just starting to see a proliferation of these types of events. We're also seeing the costs increase. I know last year alone, there were over 23, 24 events that took place in 2023 alone. And when you think about this, 20, 10, 20 years ago, there probably were, you know, 18 or so events 
that cost a billion dollars, and when you move from 18 to you know a higher number, it's very costly. But I can tell you, I think people are starting to pay attention, though there is an issue in the mortgage market that is related to supply. We have a huge supply shortage of homes, both single family and multifamily. And we also have an increase in home prices and also an increase in rents, although that's abating a little bit. But in addition, we've got the mortgage interest rates that you mentioned. And so when you think about from a borrower's perspective, you know, the monthly payments that they make, people are used to, you know, increases in their payments due to uh, taxes and insurance. When you have an escrow analysis that's done by your mortgage company, usually people think, oh, you know, our taxes have gone up. And that's kind of a double-edged issue because you're happy the taxes went up because that means your property values went up but you're not happy about the payment. But now when, when escrow analyses are taking place, people are looking at the tax component and they're looking at the insurance component. And many people, not in flood zones or not in areas that have been impacted by natural disasters, are seeing increases in their property casualty insurance payments. And, it, and these are not small payments. Uh, and so it's really causing lots of issues and consternations. And I think NAIC, if I remember, issued a survey and they talked about some of the practices that you know, are currently underway where some insurance companies are not covering you know, uh, things that they used to cover. In fact, I myself am looking at my insurance policy to see what it was last year versus what it was this year, what was covered, what's not being covered, and also the cost. And what we're hearing is that the coverage is less, but the cost is more. So that's a huge issue for us. But are people aware? Probably not as much as they should be. I think that when people see increases in their mortgage payment, they attribute it to the mortgage servicer. And then you might get uh, the next level of person who, who has more awareness and they might look at the escrow analysis and figure it out. But I do think that the awareness is growing, it's increasing, but there's a lot of work that we need to do to make sure that consumers are educated about these costs and the impact that they have on households. These, these, the issues that you're raising are things <clears throat> that we've been discussing in insurance regulatory circles for quite some time. I, I like that you read your policy. <laughs> the more people that would go out and read their policies, sometimes it's uh, frustrating for us um, because it, it wasn't that big of a cost and people really didn't pay as much attention. But well, you, you know, you only read the policy when something, when happens. something happens. And yeah. so it's like, well, this happened, you know, roof leaking, whatever, and is it covered? And so I think we need to get people in the habit when they're getting the policies and when they're up for renewal to take a look and see What's changed? What's different? What am I paying for? And what is covered and what is not? I, I couldn't agree with you more. I'd love to see more consumers looking at it before the loss. So as conservator of Fannie and Freddie, uh, which owns most of the residential mortgage debt in this country, how is FHFA responding to the rising property insurance rates? So a couple of things. One, we are very engaged because Fannie and Freddie do both single family and multifamily. Um, they purchase the loans and provide uh, liquidity you know, by creating the secondary market for the loans. But we had two insurance symposiums. We had one for a single family um, business line and the other for the multifamily business line. And we pulled together a number of stakeholders and a number of commissioners were there. We were very grateful for their participation, along with the Federal Insurance Office. I thought I saw Tom Workman, but I can't see a thing up here, so. right in front of us. Okay, well, hi, Tom, if <laughs> you're he here. He's and to Ethan, I know, I, I know you're here, too. But having said that, you know, we are looking at this issue and really trying to figure out, you know, what are the things that we know? What are the things that we can change? Who do we need to talk to with regard to um, providing notice when we hear that certain insurance companies are leaving you know, regions of the country, this is very, very impactful for Fannie and Freddie because 
they cannot purchase a loan unless that loan has property casualty. And also, when a borrower has the property casualty insurance and a natural disaster or something happens on the back end, what we're finding is that you know, they're, the borrowers have to provide coverage, but it, the coverage is only up to the loan balance as opposed to the replacement uh, cost. And so that's a big surprise for people. So just understanding what the requirements are. So when you're a first time home buyer and you're in California looking for a mortgage loan and you figure out that you have to have property casualty, when you hear that a number of large companies are leaving the region and they're not issuing new policies, then you have to add on to what's already a very complex process. I mean, buying a house, especially here, is probably one of the most painful processes from a paper perspective. Um, and, and just you know, providing information is just arduous. And then to complicate that by looking for having to find you know, insurance providers, I think, is really um, complex. But what we're also hearing is for persons that are building like condo projects or multifamily uh, properties that the premiums are such that they just can't make the numbers work. And so we're seeing and hearing that people are starting to increase their deductibles to what you know, may be considered reasonable or unreasonable, but they're trying to make the numbers work when they're building you know, new homes or when they're building these multifamily complexes. And so people are really being creative in terms of how to address this issue. And so we're very hopeful that um, we can work together and try to figure out how we can, one, educate regular people, how we can work with builders and developers to try to come to some sort of um, agreement on how these numbers are going to work. Now, we also had at our insurance symposium a number of reinsurers. And you know when, when they're not just looking at US disasters, they're looking worldwide. And so costs are going up. You know, premiums are going down. Claims are going up. We understand that, but we need to figure out a solution because this impacts everyone. And if it hasn't impacted someone yet, it will. It's just a matter of time. Well, we couldn't agree more. And I can tell you that state insurance regulators are more than willing to work with FHFA and anyone else uh, on this problem to, to uh, see different ways that we can uh, assist. So on that, uh, you know, obtaining insurance is one way to manage homeowners' risk. Uh, but do you have any thoughts on the role that mitigation and resilience can play uh, to reduce losses before the events? Of course. That came up a lot in both symposia. And there was an, an infrastructure bill and an energy bill that was passed by the Congress. And there's lots of funds available. So when we look at resiliency and building homes that can withstand some of these events that occur, we're trying to figure out ways to complement the programs that are offered by our regulated entities, Fannie and Freddie and the Home Loan Bank, with some of the programs that are coming out of other parts of government because we want to see homes that are resilient. We want to see homes that can withstand these events. And it's really interesting because we have really um, thought about this in a huge way but we haven't seen, and what we heard at the uh, conferences was we want to see the nexus to insurance companies and like their premium. So what we heard was if borrowers spend the time and the money making their new homes or existing homes more resilient, then they'd like to see some benefits in the monthly premium and not just a one time, but it needs to be over time. But they need to see a direct tie into you know, what's in it for me. Because when we talk about resilience, many times we talk about it in, well, you'll see the benefits over you know, X number of years. Well, people want to see a benefit now. And the best way to show an immediate benefit is through some sort of reduction. But how do you do that when everything else is going up? And so you know, just trying to figure out, again, how to make those numbers work, I think, is going to be um, really important. 
You know, so we, we've had uh, states have resilience programs. Speci uh, specifically, Alabama has been pretty successful. Yeah. And I know a number of us, including my state, are going to be putting in bills. I just heard uh, from the Oklahoma commissioner that they just had it passed. Uh, but I think you're going to see more and more of those state programs, and we'd love to partner uh, because we all see the pictures after the disaster where the one house right. is standing, right? right? Yes. And that's, yeah. that house has always had these resilience and these high, uh, high resilient uh, measures done before. So we'd, we'd love to see that. In, in addition to the cost, I mean, the, the dislocation for a homeowner to be out, uh, you know, just it, it's anything to do to avoid that would be better. And maybe uh, partnering together, uh, we can come to a, uh, something that can benefit a lot of the homeowners. I would agree with that. I think um, like HUD just recently came out with building codes and they're updating their standards. And to the extent you know, we can work together to figure out, you know, again, those are ways to make new homes more resilient. But existing homes, we've got to come up with some renovation programs that are affordable, but that can do the job. And again, there has to be this give and take because you know, there has to be a benefit for all stakeholders. Otherwise, people just aren't going to do it, and we're going to be talking about this, but we need to kind of move forward and you know, execute some of these programs. But happy to work with you all on this. That would be great. Yeah. Um, so switching subjects, a number of insurers have become among the largest customers and partners of the federal home loan banks. The banks see the insurers as stable customers who can post high-quality collateral, and the insurers see the banks as a source of liquidity. FHFA announced a review of the federal home loan banking system. Uh, what can you tell us about the status of that review and any impact it might have on the insurance sector? Sure. So we undertook a uh, probably about a year and a half long review of the federal home loan bank system. First, most people don't know what it, the home loan banks are or what they do. And it was interesting because the home loan banks have been around. They've been a source of liquidity for the banking system. Actually, they started as being um, liquidity providers for non-banks back in the 30s. And over time, the members of the home loan bank system, and if people don't know what that is, I usually call them, they're like banks for, they're the banks for bankers and credit unions and insurance companies. And they provide advances to banks, credit unions, insurance companies, so they could continue to have liquidity. But the insurance companies here in the United States are members of the home loan bank system. Uh, we completed our report and issued it in November. And certainly the collateral is outstanding. We're trying to help with that supply issue that I spoke about earlier. And we're thinking that you know insurance companies and other members of the home loan bank system can do a lot to really provide uh, more supply in the communities in which they serve. We looked at some of the um, assets that the uh, insurance companies have as it relates to home loan bank collateral, and they really purchase, because there's a requirement, if you're going to use the home loan banks, then you have to engage in something that moves towards residential you know, of home ownership, and that could be a, a home, single family, or multifamily. Most of the assets from the insurance companies is in, was in CMBS, or commercial mortgage-backed securities. And so we think that there's a lot more opportunity for insurance companies to be helpful in terms of helping with the supply issues throughout this country and would love to have a conversation with them you know, as they are getting discounted funding from the home loan banks to manage their balance sheets about how they can be helpful to help us address this global crisis we're having. So that's another good, good avenue to go down. Um, FHFA recently announced a pilot program that would eliminate title insurance for certain mortgage transactions. We are getting a lot of questions, oh, so I'm going to ask you. Okay. <laughs> so, what well, can you tell me about that program and whether you think it might expand? Sure. So let me first explain to you what it is and what it is not. And what it is, Fannie and Freddie require lenders to, com to represent that the loan is in a first lien position and that it has clear title. That's a lender rep. Now, borrowers most of the time purchase title insurance 
for their home ownership. So as long as a borrower is in a home, if they purchased a home, they will have title insurance until they leave that home. The lender's requirement for title insurance or attorney opinion letters, because the requirement for lenders is really only to prove that this loan is unencumbered and it's a, it's a first lien. So it needs to be clear title and it just needs to be unencumbered. And so the lenders can make that representation or be in compliance through title insurance or through an attorney opinion letter. And so what we thought was, okay, a lot of the processes have been digitized. And so for refinance loans where the borrower is going to continue to live in the house that they already own, we would waive the requirement for title insurance for a refinance, right? And so it's a very, um, and these are on loans that Fannie Mae owns, so it's a very narrow pilot, but the process really is to see if we use a tool to access the records for a refinance for someone who's already in the house, who owns it, and who wants to stay there, and who's taking their money out to do whatever it is they do, um, that we could waive that fee and the requirement um, after we did the check, and it would be for, um, for, for the, to, to determine whether or not that loan was unencumbered and had clear title. If it's not, then certainly you know, you, you'd have to provide, you have to clear it up, you have to clear up the problem. But you, lenders can do it or they cannot, it's an option. And so this is a pilot and the primary purpose is to see if we can say borrowers who are refinancing money on their homes that they're gonna continue to live in, um, that if we could use this tool to access records that are digitized and so we are really looking forward to um, working on that pilot and sharing the results with the public. You know, we've got to change the way that we think about doing mortgages. And since this is insurance, I'll just go out on a limb here and say that the mortgage industry has been you know, working the way it works for a very long time. For example, we're still using the classic FICO credit score model, and they've used it for almost 28 years, and so FHFA, as the regulator for Fannie and Freddie, have required both Fannie and Freddie to update their credit score model to you know, FICO 10T and Vantage score. It'll be the first time Vantage score has entered into the mortgage process, but these new credit score models take into consideration things like positive rental payment, they take into consideration utility bills. They take lots of, you know, the way that we live today into consideration in a way that the old model did not. And so there's many times a reluctance to change. But when you think about, and I'll use a um, company like Blockbuster, for example, you know, 10, 20 years ago, Blockbuster was on every corner, you know, with the VHS and refuse to adopt streaming. And so trying to you know, make the change, and it's a gradual change, it's not abrupt and it's not a blunt, you know, on this day you have to change. We're trying to be measured, to be thoughtful, because everything that we do, we have to do it in a safe and sound manner, because we are regulators after all. And so you know, we're piloting, which means testing and learning. And, so we've got a lot of comments, you know, people think, oh, Fannie Mae's trying to get into the insurance business. They are not, uh, or you're increasing the risk. We do not think that we are. Lenders have a choice. If they wish to do this, they can. If they don't, they can purchase title insurance or an attorney opinion letter. So that, in a nutshell, is what it is. Okay, well, I hope, I, I hope that answers some of the questions that we've been getting, because we've been kind of yeah. referring to you. Well, so. you know, if you get questions, if people have questions after this, if they could send them to you or yep. NAIC, just send them my way, and we'll, I'll send you a written response. That obviously. would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think that would really help the conversation. Sure. So unfortunately, we're running out of time. We only have 
29 seconds, but let me give you, is there anything else that you'd like to say to this audience? We look forward to working with you in the future, but is there? Yeah, so one, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, and it's my understanding that many of the participants are having some of the same challenges that we're having, and I'd love to work and hear about some of the solutions and things that you all are gonna test and learn and try or pilot, and would love to be a part of that conversation. And hopefully, you know, of course you and I will stay yeah. engaged, but I really would like to get a broader perspective of how things are being addressed in other countries. That's wonderful, I think we'd all appreciate that. So I believe I've run out of time. Is Eric, there he is. The book is coming. 